All right, so I think I have at least almost all the speakers for this session here. So we will start if Aurora is ready. Maybe. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Uh, so okay. our first talk in this session is about large X asymptotics in nuclear and high-end PDFs. Uh, so you have 18 minutes, including time for questions. And I will let you know when you reach the two minutes before you have to stop talking, OK? OK, thank you. Do you see my slides? Yes. OK, wonderful. So thank you very much for accepting this talk and the change of speaker. So I'm going to talk about uh, testing logics asymptotics in nucleon and pi on PDFs, both really interesting. And it's a work that has been done in collaboration with Pavel Landowski here, I think is probably connected to. And this is the reference to, to our paper, if you want to have a look. OK, so um, we heard about Lajax doing this, uh, this workshop already. On, on Monday, there was a nice panel talk by, by Cynthia Keppel about Lajax. And she said something that was really interesting that in the next one or two years, we're going to have a lot of improvements in the understanding of the Lajax regime. And this is really, really exciting, I must say. Um, so we're going to focus on this talk on how to interpret those primordial PDFs based on scattering data. So uh, first, let me mention that it's, it's been a continuous effort to understand Lajax regime. And you can see here from CT18 and XNX leading order here, this ratio D over U. And uh, things have been studied. I think uh, Pavel covered it in his talk. And there's the, the role of parameterization, detailed uncertainties, and, and all those things um, being uh, under, under study uh, right now and before, too. And why is it so important to study large X PDFs? Basically, the large X, uh, what you call large X, covers two main regions, which is the valence region, about X.5, and uh, goes to threshold limits when X really goes to one. And there's a, there's a difference between uh, large X from theory, what you call X goes to one, and from phenomenology, which is uh, X between 0.5 and one, which is a, like a huge coverage of, of X region. So why do we like large X? Because it is ideal for probing non perturbative structure of hadrons. So if you think about these early pictures of, of QCD that we had, uh, and at that time there were early pictures of this uh, hadron dynamics that evolved into QCD. And there were also early models for hadron dynamics that have evolved and, and, and paved the way for this, uh, all this non perturbative approach that we have now, including finger Dyson studies and, and all those things. So both have evolved in a different uh, way and both are extremely interesting and have uh, the, same, uh, the same physics. And we want to bridge this non perturbative approach to these perturbative pictures we, we have here. So in, in this talk, I will, uh, I will talk about large X. And, and, and the way we're going to uh, consider large X in, in this case is through the quark counting rules, which was a classical prediction of uh, this early QCD theory that we had. And to do that, we're going to talk about functional mimicry. And it is basically uh, this role of the parameterization that uh, we, we put into the, the PDFs. And this is going to be done for CT18 and next, next leading order for the proton. And I'm going to talk slightly about the pion PDF too. And uh, the conclusions will be like uh, interpretation of this data against physical manifestations of the, of the, of the QCD dynamics, actually. OK, so um, why is it so interesting to, uh, to, to consider this, this bridge between non-perturbative and, and phenol PDFs? So if you take the picture of, uh, of, the, of a proton at um, the hadronic scale, which is below 1 GV, you have this pre-factorized picture, all these non-perturbative dynamics that are extremely interesting. And if you go to, to the factor, to factorization scale, which is much higher than 1 GV, then you will have this quasi patterning free, uh, free patterning degrees of freedom. And then you will have, that's where you're gonna have this global, global analysis, basically. And you're gonna have this leading power approximation to this full dynamic. Which is too from, from phenomenology is really different the way you, you define them. And it is interesting to, to find a way to relate the X dependence from both pictures. And how we can do that, there's, there's one with many ways to, to be explored, actually, but the way we, we, we explored it today is this quark counting rules. So the quark counting rules, I just show them uh, here in, in blue for the, um, for the sort of functions. They are this uh, early QCD, as I said, you can see the references here and uh, many others. It was proved for sort of functions actually, and in, especially in DIS, the, the threshold limit in DIS when X goes to one. And it was proved for exclusive and inclusive processes, as you can see here. And basically it relates this, um, this limit to threshold when X Bjorken goes to one to, uh, to the number of spectators and some helicity combination here. And so in, in, a, in a more uh, modern language, you can extend, well, 
it has been extended to um, to PDF and polarized PDF in this case. As, as you can see from this diagram, basically uh, the way we understand it from for PDFs, it's that uh, the unpolarized PDF should go at one minus x to the power three for the valence quarks, and for the gluon, it should be a power uh, which is greater than four and greater than five for the C quarks. And so now we want to see if actually we can we can see a trace of those um, of those quark counting rules from from the global analysis. And uh, how do we do that? So, so first, there's this. Um, I want to mention that it is complementary to testing first principle. So it is not exactly a first principle in itself, but it's complementary to to constrained PDFs, and also that it is scale dependent. Okay. So do we observe quark counting rules in data described by uh, PQCD? So the question can be can be asked in different way. Do we see evidence or hints? So um, there's something we can we can do, and an interesting thing to, to, to do is uh, can uh, one model or one picture agree with um, with the data? So here we're just checking this y minus x to a power a behavior. So we can just uh, we can basically uh, check if the the model agrees with the data, but it's not an evidence. It's different from uh, what they call the evidence of a polynomial form. And the, the reason why it is different is that because you can find many ways to, uh, to define a polynomial form. There's, one, one more, there's more than one solution to the choice of this, of this parameterization. And um, how does it translate here for, for large x? Basically, if you look at this uh, large x region here, you will have this uh, global against local degree of polynomial, as you can see here, for example. So uh, what, what is large x? As I said before, in theory, uh, x goes to 1, and in phenol, we will be in this region here. So obviously, um, the, the local uh, degree of the polynomial will be different from the global one. And this, is, this brings us to this uh, polynomial mimicry that we discussed in, in the paper, is that there is a mathematical equivalence of polynomials of different orders. And this can be shown uh, actually really well from, from Bezier curves that you can see here. So you would have uh, this Bezier curve, basically this, this expression there based on, on Bergeron polynomials. And you can see that we have the same uh, curve here, the same uh, polynomial curve, based on two different polynomials of different degrees, but they are equ equivalent. So what, what we have found is that you can, you can actually interpolate discrete data points, as you can see on, the, on this plot on the right-hand side. And, um, and, and actually, it, 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 there's a closed form solution for this problem if the number of points uh, is, is equal to the number of, uh, to the degree of the um, plus one. Exactly. So you, you can, in principle, if you, if you have this in that case here, you can see this is beautifully uh, expressed. If you have um, points, discrete points, you can interpolate, and it will be, in that case, a unique solution. What is really handy, too, is that, uh, especially thinking about large x, when you go to x uh, equals to 1 here, you can see on the, on the right-hand side, you can actually uh, expand in monomial of uh, 1 minus x. And uh, this is shown here. You can see this. Um, for this, this specific uh, choice here of 30 x squared, one minus x squared, that the, the two first monomial are equal to zero, and then you find the, the second one and then the third one here, and then you go into the fourth. So this is really handy when we want to check this one minus x uh, behavior here. So does it mean that we can pin down this large x behavior? If you take like a, most, a more realistic, realistic uh, function, you can see here this uh, uh, funny uh, function here, and if you do the same exercise for this, this function, which is one which is a bit more realistic than the one I showed before, depending on, on, on the way we span, uh, we span the, the data points, uh, the way they are spanned, their, their interval, and the number, the, the, here we have the same number of points, nine points. The way uh, we, uh, we change the interval between them and how we span the X range between them will actually change the way we can reconstruct this, uh, this uh, polynomial form. As, as you can see here, we have the same function, and we just change the, the points in X. And we can see that this interpolation, though it is exact here, does not actually reflect the same, the same uh, monomial expansion here, especially for the, for the monomial n, uh, n equal one, two, and three. Zero would be zero, and you can see that it would change anyway. So in that case, it means that uh, we cannot reconstruct uh, unless we have some conditions, extra conditions here. So um, does it still mean that we cannot see uh, hints of quark counting rules well, well let, let's have a look at different things. So if you take the data for F2, described by PQCD here, we can still study uh, this effective exponent. So it's called A2, um, which reflects here. So if you take the CT18 functional form here, you would have this x to the power A1, 1 minus x to the power A2 times uh, a Bezier curve, basically, which is a modulation of this, uh, of this um, uh, function here. So this, this A2 here, 
actually will 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 be uh, at x goes to one, you will find it true a two. But then this modulation will give you an effective a two here that can be studied by this function. That's that's the derivative of the logarithm of this uh, f two divided by the other, well by the by uh, the logarithm of one minus x. And if you take this 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 derivative, you will see this effective a two at x that is slightly smaller than one. And that's what we, sh we show here on this, uh, what I call the rainbow plot on the right hand side. So uh, we, we, we've done that for, uh, for three different scales here that you can, you can see. So for low scale, first we have to cut the resonance region. And then you go through uh, Q, well, uh, 4 GV and 10 GV, and you can do the same thing uh, for higher scales. And you will see that it kind of hold converge to the expected result of three here for the, for the, um, for the balance quarks here for F2. And so on, on this part, what I sh showed to you is that there, there's an error, of course, so within error, they, they agree with three. But what, what happens, so first you see that there's a non-negligible when Q square, a different values of, of, of X here was slightly smaller than one. And also there are two sources of uncertainties here. So we show the uh, actual error, which is the narrower band and the choice of parameterization, which is the, the larger band that you can see here. So you have the envelope of the two. So here, large X depends really, um, a lot on the choice of parameterization since there's no much data here. And uh, what you can see is that for the function of, for the, sorry, for the Strutter function, it works uh, pretty well, which is uh, a, good, a good sign. So now, uh, does it mean that we're gonna find the same thing for the PDF themselves with another observables? So let's just uh, go to this, uh, briefly to this uh, NNL of uh, Fino PDFs that uh, Pavel talked about yesterday. And I just want to mention something here uh, about those plots. So that's the, the CT18 um, errors. And you can see that uh, many functional forms have been, have been studied here. And you can see a difference here for the gluon and the, and the U quark, how they, get, they span the, the error bands here. Um, and actually, you see where their data, they are all sitting there, and then where they know data, they have the different behavior. So, uh, and actually, this has been done for 363 functional forms. And if you take uh, this A2 effective that I just mentioned, for this 363 functional form, we can have scatter plots of uh, this A2 effective for, uh, here I show for U balance against D balance, and you can see what we expect. So first uh, we see on the, on the left-hand side, so what you get from, from CT, um, that's the tabulated one. So A2 is the same for U uh, balance and D balance. So you have this, uh, this curve, this band here. And then if you just take this uh, propagation of the error on A2 effective for CT18, and then hello, you find this, this ellipse here. And what you expect from QCR is, is this point, actually this point here, just, oops, sorry, in the middle. And, um, and so what, what you to get from this, um, from this uh, the, the replicas that we used is a different uh, kind of ellipse. And you have this, this shape, and you can see that this shape evolves with, with Q, but the shape is, is kind of conserved. So what evolves is the, the value of the, of, the exponent, of the exponent here. And it is expected to 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 mild uh, to to um, mildly run uh, expected with PQCD. So we, we find this this running here, but the shape is kind of conserved. And as you see, uh, we are close to the QCR for for large X, and with slightly uh, lower X, we we don't not so so close to that. So the same thing can be done for the for the gluon and the C here. So we do the same thing. So that's the excluded region in in gray, and you would see here the ellipse um, I showed before. And you see now that the, this uh, this cloud is slightly different at uh, at small Q values, and then aligns and evolves with larger Q values. And you see that the shape where once is is taken is is conserved with uh, with Q. And that's really interesting to see that. Two minutes. So, okay. So uh, add the effective power is the same for all processes. I'm just uh, flashing this uh, fast, and we can see that there's a dependence, dependence you can study for, uh, with L2, and they are actually different from every processes. So now, can a lot of PDFs uh, be studied from colliders, and what can we learn? And I just put here this um, the ratio of A2 uh, U balance over A2 D balance, and you can see that this ratio is pretty constant over all the spectrum of, of Q, which is really interesting to study. Uh, you see this, this uh, bridging between low Q and, and high Q values here. So that was all for the for the proton. I just want to mention really quickly the pion. So the shape of the pion is also affected with square counting rules. Here you expect to have this y minus x to the power two tail at um, for mid q squared values, and I'm showing here on top of uh, an extraction from from Fermilab data and uh, NGL model here. And then what, the difference that you see here, you have um, manifestation of low energy QCD, and what you have here, you have this concurring effects coming from the emergent hadronic mass that broadens the PDF 
and the Qualcomm deduce that I expect this one on the sex to the power two scale. And and so um that's sorry. And so what happens that often in, in global analysis we have this one minus x tail appearing, and then we think that maybe could explain why we we we, we don't ex we don't see this one minus x to the power two most of the time. There, there will be a talk by uh, by uh, Patrick Berry tomorrow about that, I think. Okay. So let me just go to the conclusions. Uh, I hope I'm still on time. And um, we have analyzed the quad counting rules for CT18 and next to next leading order. Uh, global fit for proton PDFs. I've slightly talked about uh, the pi on the end in the different uh, uh, framework. Uh, we've addressed the question of this universality for the processes. We've seen that it depends on the process flavors. Uh, they depend on the flavor and as well as further functions against PDF, which means in observable, we, we do find this, uh, this trace. And in the PDF, there's all these all different aspects of process and flavor coming into account in, the, in this uh, quark counting rules. So the Q square dependence is not negligible. And we also see that as uh, the global analysis rely on really complex uh, um, processes, which is not as simple as just early QCD um, pictures that we had a few, few decades ago. And, and also we, we questioned this university of the quark counting rules uh, in, is, um, in, in front of the factorization corrections that we could have. And also what we, we see is that mimicry can reconcile most of this parameterization uh, form for the PDFs uh, and, and the measurements. So that there's, a, there's, a, there's some um, uh, play here that we, we can play with that at some, some point, but then we have to be really careful with what we understand from with this mimicry and this one minus x uh, power. And, and of course, we highlight this parameterization dependence and the uncertainties coming from that large x. And the, the real conclusion is that this interpretative effective y minus x uh, exponent uh, uh, that we find is A2 effective and the true A2 when x goes to one contains information that goes from non-perturbative manifestations uh, up to uh, really high energy observables. And that's really, really uh, interesting um, from the logics point of view. That's why we like logics actually. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Do we have questions for Aurora? Yes, no. I okay, Robert, please go ahead. Um, yes, can you show your results for the glue one again? Yeah, thanks. So yeah, it's a very rapid or a very um noticeable dependence with Q squared. It goes from about three, which is rather lower than you would expect at the lowest yes. values of Q squared up to six or seven at the highest values of Q squared. Yes. Given it's that rapid, is it really meaningful to have the sort of estimate there or is there some particular value of Q where you would expect your value from the, the counting rules to be approximately appropriate? Okay, so you mean, okay, how do we go from here to here and where is the where should, should we check the, the quark counting rules? Um, well, given well, that it varies from three to six, then that means that either there is a preferred scale at which you would expect the counting rule to work, or you can't really take it seriously at all for this quantity. Okay, okay, that is, that's a really interesting question. So actually, I, I don't know the plot where you see like a, a narrower span of, of Q squared. Uh, what you will see basically would be uh, similar to what I see here. So you can see that for values that are not exactly hex goes to one, but slightly uh, smaller than one, you have this difference here. So you, you have a, a running. And it seems that when, when, when Q is, is, is too small, you don't expect it first because it's uh, not exactly what you would expect from, from PQCD. So um, if there's any preferred value, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But what, what is clear here is that from, from this CTEC, uh, CT18 point of view at 1.3 GV, you don't, you don't see this, uh, this um, behavior of, um, of the gluon that goes um, N uh, greater than, than four, that's four, yes. Yes, but then it, it aligns with, with Q right away, almost right away, yes. Does it uh, answer your question? Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, for the for the gluon, it's far more rapid than it is for the, the quarks, for example. In fact, for the yes. C quarks, it doesn't change all that much at all. But um, so for the gluon, it, it even though you haven't got a, it looks as though Q of nearly a hundred is when the power is about five. Which is perhaps rather larger than you might expect for a conservative parameter. No, actually, okay. 
So actually, I had a plot, but I don't have it here anymore. Uh, that was showing for two and three and four GVs, and it actually it kind of aligns really really quickly. So we don't need to go to 100 GV to get it aligned in, in, in this way, or up to to four or five. So it, it goes, uh, I think, about Q point uh, equal four. Uh, we we already have uh, this this the same shape here. The shape is is conserved from uh, same same as here. You start at four GV, and then you, you find exactly the same the same behavior with a slight shift, um, as you can see here. But uh, it's it's really quick. So I would say that maybe 1.3 GV is not where you expect in that case to, to see this, this, the quark counting rules, but with the running, you find it really fast. Yeah. Okay. Perhaps if I may add quickly to this comment, uh, of course, the gluon is very small at large accents. So therefore, I, well, what we find from this study is that there is a certain hierarchy of the, let's say, trustworthiness of this quark counting rules. We believe it's likely to work for the full stru structure function F2 as well as for the valence quarks. But as you see indeed, Robert, in this figure, well, there is much more uncertainty for uh, U bar, D bar, and the gluon. So, but those are, again, are very small PDFs that will be affected by all sorts of things at, like, at, small, at large X. But it must be scheme dependent for the gluon in a more uh, dramatic way than it might be for the quarks as well, I would imagine. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, if further discussion, we will continue, please do it in the chat. Uh, we thank her for a nice talk. And uh, we move on to our next speaker, Tia Jung. So please, can you um, share your slides? Hello, Pia. Can you hear me and see my yes. screen? Everything is perfect. Go ahead. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to tell you an alternative parameterization of the CT18 with the input from lattice QCD. So let me first uh, br uh, briefly review the CT18. In the CT18, we have uh, included a lot of the new data from LCC. For example, we have uh, the new uh, Joyen data from both LCCB, CMS, and others. And also we have the new jet data from both CMS and others for both 7TV and 8TV. And we also have the new TDBAR data from both CMS and others. And for the theory calculation at NNLO, we use the uh, uh, April Gris and FASNO to reach the NLO calculation times the, the, the K factor between NNLO uh, and the NLO. And uh, for the parameterization of the CT18 at the QNA scale, as you can see that in the very large X region and very small X region, we have a very huge uncertainty. It is basically uh, is a result of the lack of data constraint the, the region of the uh, global analysis. And that's also the reason that when, when, you, when we try on lots of different kinds of parameterization, you see the uh, uh, different kinds of PDF can totally spread out when the uh, different parameterization goes to very large or very small X region. So as a result, uh, at a QNA scale, the parameterization, uh, we, we have a six degree of freedom for, for the parameterization, which is uh, Gurong, U-valence, D-valence, U-bar, D-bar, and Strange. And in the CT18, we have assumed that S-bar equal to S, and uh, for the physical degree of freedom of the U and D, which compose both uh, the valence and the C component. For each of the uh, degree of freedom, uh, we have the uh, uh, parameterization in this way, in the middle of the screen, as you can see here. Uh, for the A1 term here, it controls the behavior of the uh, degree of freedom for the very, very small X region when X close to zero. For the A2 term, it controls the uh, behavior of the degree of freedom when S close to one. So as a result, the CT18 has uh, uh, 29 ship parameter and we have a total cash square to be 4292 with the total number of, of data point to be 3681. So uh, the new uh, global analysis study in this work uh, is motivated by the uh, Goffrey sound rule. Which, uh, which predicts that the uh, difference between uh, F2P and F2N to be one third, with the assumption that the U bar and D bar to be generated by Gruen splitting, and so that uh, U bar should be equal to U bar. But 
the NC data of the 1990s tell us that it is not the case. The Gaffey sum rule should be 0.24 instead of one third. As a result, the NC data tell us that D bar not equal to U bar. But the question is that what's the origin of D bar not equal to U bar? So if we go back to look into the hadronic tensor of the passive integral formalism in Euclidean space, we can uh, found that the Feynman diagram of the four-point function can be categorized into three kinds. For the first kind, which is uh, uh, left figure in the, on the screen, uh, it tells us that the pattern line starting from the nucleon and go forward in time and hit the current and go back to the nucleon. And for the middle uh, figure, Feynman diagram is starting from the nucleon and go backward in time and hit the current, then go back to the nucleon. And for the last diagram on the right hand side, it's corresponding to the uh, pattern light disconnected to the nucleon and heat the uh, uh, current. So for the uh, last uh, right hand, uh, for the figure on the right hand side, it's corresponding to the this kind of C, which is uh, the uh, U bar and D bar generated by ground splitting, as we uh, expect in general. And for the figure in the middle, which corresponding, we call it the kinetic C. This kind of diagram uh, is responsible for the violation of the Gaffey sum rule. So as a result, as you can see, that the physical degree of freedom, which is the U, D, U bar, and D bar, compose both the valence com component and this, this kind of C component. So uh, this, uh, this Feynman uh, passive integral formalism in the uh, Euclidean uh, space has uh, correspondence in the uh, well, with the quasi PDF from the lattice QCD. For the uh, first two diagrams has corresponding to the disk uh, kinetic C insertion. And uh, the uh, last diagram on the right-hand side corresponding to the uh, disk kind of C insertion in the quasi PDF. So as a result, the negative, negative X region of the quasi PDF corresponding to the kinetic C uh, PDF, the degree of freedom. Uh, this point has been illustrated by Professor Kefelio in their recent uh, paper. In order to accommodate the kinetic C degree freedom in our uh, global analysis, we need one more constraint. So we uh, recent, recently, the lattice calculation tell us that the ratio between the moment of the S plus S bar and uh, the moment of the uh, U bar and D bar for this kind of C insertion has the ratio to be 0.822. So this will be our only input from the lattice uh, calculation in our uh, global analysis. So as a result, in the global analysis, we, we still have a six degree of freedom, which is uh, the Gruen U valence, D valence, kinetic C for U bar, and kinetic C from D bar, and also the this kind of C for strange. So first of all, for the this kind of C components, but just like the CT18, we first assume that the S bar equal to S. And similarly, for the this kind of C component for U and U bar, we also assume that they are equal, and also for the D and D bar. We further assume the, the SO spin symmetry for the U and D quark. So as a result, it leads to the uh, relation like the, the one on the screen. So, and also for the kinetic C component, we further assume that the uh, kinetic C component for the U and U bar are equal, and also for the D and D bar. So as a result, when we consider the uh, parameterization of the CT18 CS, which is the new global analysis with which accommodate with the with the kinetic C uh, degree of freedom, is mostly happens on the U bar and D bar, which con contains both the kinetic C. Uh, degree of freedom and also this kind of C degree of freedom. For the PDF uh, larger than QNAR scale, it, it is obtained by the degrad evolution equation, just like the CT18. Recently, the secret data released their new result, which tell us that in the D bar of U bar for the large X region, the D bar larger than U bar. Uh, and as they tell us that the, their uh, data has a very good agreement with the CT18 NLO. And we also found that the CT18 NNLO also have a very good agreement with the sequence data, like you can see on the screen. But the downside is that the CT18 NLO cannot fit with the EA6 data for the very large X region for the last two points. 
but and also as you can see that the the uh, ct18 cs that's uh, the our new global analysis with the uh, accommodation of the kinetic c degree freedom which is uh, the green line also has a very good agreement with the sequence data so for the small x uh, small x behavior of the new global analysis we first assume that the D bar equal to U bar when X close to zero, just like the CT18. And for the, this kind of C component for both the, the strange uh, U bar and D bar, the, we, uh, we further assume that they, they have the same behavior when X close to zero. But for the kinetic C uh, degree of freedom, we, have a, we actually don't have a much idea how they should behave in the small X region. So we did a scan on the A1 parameter for the uh, U bar kinetic C and D bar kinetic C. As you can see on the screen that it tells us that when A1 goes to a smaller value, not just the HERA data, which is the green line, but also the ESX data has a, has a relatively larger chi square. But when the A1 parameter goes to a relatively larger value, you can see that the sequence state data don't have, have a relatively larger value. So as a result, we choose uh, the A1 parameter for the new global analysis to be one in our, in our uh, CT18 CS feed. As a result, the CT18 CS feed has a total chi-square to be 4299. Uh, and uh, as, uh, allow me to remind you that in this uh, new global analysis, we did not include the sequence data in our global analysis. So compared to the CT18, we have uh, only seven units higher in the chi-square. So because uh, after we obtain the uh, uh, global analysis of the CT18 CS, we can directly compare the PDF with the data. For, uh, for example, you can we can compare the D bar minus U bar of the kinetic C, wh which has a very good agreement with the uh, ESX data and the Hermi data. And the least part of the D bar of U bar is responsible for violation of the Gaffrey sound rule. And because of the CT18 CS is updated by the global analysis directly, so we can see how the kinetic C uh, degree of freedom behave directly by the global analysis, just like, the, for example, like the U bar CS and D bar CS on the screen. So for the, this kind of C degree of freedom, uh, as you can see that the both the, uh, this kind of C for the strange and also the, this kind of C for U bar and D bar, they all have a very good agreement with the CT18, uh, strange PDF. And also for the uh, kinetic C degree of freedom for the UND, uh, and they also has a very good agreement with the, um, with the UND for the, in, in the CT18. And also for when we consider the ratio between the S plus S bar and over the D bar over U bar, we found that the the ratio of the, uh, the so-called capital RS of this ratio has a behavior to be uh, uh, 0.8 in the, when X close to zero. It's a, this is the result when we include the, uh, the condition from the lattice QCD, which is uh, the 0.822. So because we can obtain the uh, global analysis by using the, by including the, the uh, new, new input from the C, uh, from the lattice calculation, we can directly calculate the moment of the CT18 CS for, for various uh, degree of freedom. For example, like the kinetic C and this, this kind of C uh, individually, one by one. So this will be a, a direct, direct comparison between the global analysis and the, the lattice calculation for other the tuna scale instead of limiting to the U minus D and strange. So um, basically, that's uh, all that I want to uh, present to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for being on time, well in time. Um, so Robert has a question. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, can I ask how many parameters you have in the CS fit as input parameters you have in CS fit compared to the standard CT18 fit? Yes, uh, in the CT18, we have a uh, um, 29 parameter, as we mentioned in the slides. And uh, in the CT18 CS, we actually use 25 parameters. Yes. Uh, okay, so it's there, there's a slight additional reduction other than this one condition that you impose relating the normalization of the strange to the 
uh, light scene. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, as, as we mentioned here, when we consider the small behavior of the disconnect C component, it will reduce some of the degree of freedom. All right. Uh, I don't see anyone else uh, raising their hand. So thank you very much for a nice talk. Thank you. And we move now to our next speaker, Eric Moffat, who will talk about simultaneous multicolor analysis of PDFs and transmutation functions. If you can please share your slides. Eric. I'm working on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on. There you are. Working in full screen? Yeah, perfect. Go ahead. Great. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. And I'm going to be talking about uh, new results of a simultaneous Monte Carlo analysis of parton densities and fragmentation functions using the GM methodology. And so the motivation behind this fit, doing this new fit was uh, is because of there's no significant tension between uh, large transverse momentum data and fixed order predictions using existing collinear uh, parton distribution function, the fragmentation functions. And it's very important to resolve these, this tension in order to be able to study transverse momentum dependent PDFs and fragmentation functions. And so to facilitate, to facilitate exploring the reasons for this tension, we decided to do a new uh, fit using GM methodology. The GM methodology specifically is a multi-step Monte Carlo fit utilizing uh, Bayesian inference. And our specific fit is a simultaneous fit of PDFs, charged pion, kion, and unidentified charged hadron fragmentation functions. And this is the first uh, such fit, simultaneous fit involving the charged hadrons. So just to uh, go over the parameterization we use for our functions, um, the, this uh, template T shows the basic functional form that we use for all the functions. Uh, the vector A is uh, contains the parameters that are fit, and that is the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta shape parameters, and then the M normalization parameter. And the integral in the denominator of the template is ensures that the uh, uh, the factor M is equal to the second moment. And now for the uh, identified charge hadron fragmentation functions, we don't actually parameterize the whole function. Instead, we define it, the whole function as the sum of uh, the pion fragmentation function plus the, the kion fragmentation function, plus a residual function that accounts for the other hadrons. And it's the residual function that is actually parameterized per the template. So just to summarize the Monte Carlo Bayesian using Bayesian inter, inter, inference. So we can, there's a probability distribution P that uh, defines the probability that a particular set of parameters A uh, provides a, a good fit to the data. And we can estimate this by as a product of a, what we call a likelihood function times a, a posterior distribution of the parameter of the parameters. And for our fits, we use the likelihood function equal to a uh, Gaussian function of the chi-squared using the chi-squared. And this is the, the definition of the chi-squared we use. Now the, uh, the expectation value and variance of, the, of any observable would be equal to this integrated function inter integrals using the uh, probability distribution. But this, it's impractical to actually do this integral. So we use a dis discretized form where uh, we generate in replicas, uh, where each replica is using a different set of parameters, a, k. And then we, we get the expectation value by averaging the results. And for in each replica, we use the least squares fit to obtain the, the maximum likelihood, which corresponds to minimum chi-squared for And so we do this whole fit process through a series of steps. Initially, the, all the functions parameters are uh, generated, the priors, the initial priors are, a, uh, are randomly selected for each replica. And then for the first steps, we fit the individual functions to the data sets that only involve that function. So we start with uh, fitting the PDF to DIS 
And then we fit the PDF to DIS, Andrelia, and Saitama simultaneously. We also fit the fragmentation functions individually to their SIA data. And then all of that is used as priors, uh, add, as priors to a step where we add the, the CITIS data to the fits. In the, in the end, there's a final fit where we're fitting all, PD, all the PDFs fragmentation fun and fragmentation functions simultaneously to all the data we involved in the fit. And that's how we obtain our end, our end results. So here's a list of the data sets we included in the fit. Uh, we, we Inclusive DIS data, semi-inclusive DIS data, uh, E plus E minus data, as well as drill YAN. You'll notice we did not include Hermes data in, in, the, in the CITIS data in this fit. And that's because in the past, JAM has had difficulty getting uh, good descriptions of the Hermes data. So it, it, we only use the compass data. So this slide is summarizing the chi-squared results of our fit. Um, the table gives the, the chi-squared broken down by the uh, specific processes. And then the, on the plot on the right, the left panel is the chi-squared for the individual data sets. And the left is showing what we call the residual, which is just the data minus theory over the uncertainty. And uh, the, the bit gold band is the uh, one plus or minus one sigma from the average of all the replicas. And the bars on the, for each point are the actual theory, or data uncertainties. <clears throat> So what we can see here is that uh, overall the, the fit is good. It's a one point, chi squared is 1.26, but uh, you can see there's a wide difference in, if you look at the uh, SIA data, the blue, you can see that some of the sets get are fit really well while others are have really poor fitting. And I will go into what's behind that uh, when I get we start looking at the data and theory plots. So before we get to SIA, here's the plot of the CITIS multiplicities as a function of Z and uh, each panel is the uh, bin of Z and the different colors are the bins of Y of the compass data. And this specific, this plot is for the pi plus and pi minus uh, CITIS data. And you can see that the, the theory predictions fit the, the data very well. <clears throat> and the same is true for the K-on CITIS data shown here and also the charge hadron data shown on this slide. So now we also look at uh, the SIA data over theory comparisons for all the data sets. And this is where we can see that um, some of the data is fit really well, agrees really well, but while others points are, there are points that don't agree very well. And um, some of the reasons for that is you can see uh, if you look at Delphi and SLD data, you can see the theory is uh, undershooting the data in Delphi and it's overshooting the data in SLD. So there's probably some tension between the different sets of, of the uh, high energy data. And, <clears throat> and another thing that happened is we, are, we also, we restricted our data to above a Z of 0.2, uh, which was, just to maintain only use data that overlapped with the CITIS data, which was 0.2 to 0.8. And if we had included a uh, lower data, which has been done in the previous jam fits, we would have gotten better chi-squares on some of those data sets too. So this is the pion data over theory. Here is the k-on data over theory. And then finally the charged hadrons. <clears throat> So next, this this is uh, showing the our the PDF results. the The bands are uh, the average of all the replicas plus or minus one st standard deviation, and we also include uh, CJ15 and the NNPDF 3.1 uh, fragment or PDFs for comparison. Um, for the most part, there's pretty good agreement, except for you can see our uh, valence U is larger than the uh, valence that the other two collaborations got. And then, which, uh, but that's been true for uh, the previous GM fits of the fragmentation functions. So 
it's consistent with our other GM fits. The, there's also, you can see the, uh, some significant difference in the D bar minus U bar, which we're still not, we're looking into what may have, what maybe have caused that, but it's a primarily, probably it's a result of the simultaneous, the fact that it's a simultaneous fit. And since you can see the strangeness since some of the functions as one function adjusts, uh, gets changed, other functions have to adjust to get the same theoretical prediction. So it's just compensating for what uh, some other changes that occurred. Uh, here's also looking at the fragmentation functions. This plot is showing um, in the, the red is pi on, blue is k on. Uh, the green is the, the, the total hadron fragmentation function and the gold is with the residual function that was actually parameterized. And then now an interesting thing is that uh, in JAM 19, they observed that uh, better fits to SIA favored a when we did a citizens uh, simultaneous fits with CITIS, uh, the a better fit to SIA data actually corresponded to a smaller strange PDF. And if we and in this plot here, we've uh, plotted the the individual replicas, and the replicas are color coded by the uh, chi squareds. Uh, for the particular experiments. The SIA, the top row, the coloring is based on the chi-squares of the SIA data. And the uh, in the bottom row, it's uh, the color is based on the chi-squares of the CITIS data. And <clears throat> the uh, the color coding is, it's, act, it's a scaled chi-squared. It's just the, this is the fraction of away from the lowest chi-squared of all the chi-squareds, CITIS and SIA that were, that, the replicas have its lowest and the highest, and this is just scaling between those numbers. So what we can see here is that the uh, the SIA data gets the best chi squares correspond to uh, the as GM19 had observed the uh, it's a the larger uh, s bar s bar to k plus uh, fragmentation function and the smaller strange PDF. So we we've reproduced the same results as GM19 has obtained earlier. Now, so as I said, the motivation of this is to actually look at the transverse momentum dependent uh, fixed order predictions relative to data and see if we can understand that, what's behind that uh, discrepancy, the known discrepancies. And so what this plot is showing is the dotted lines are the uh, transverse momentum dependent prediction, fixed order predictions using the results that I just discussed in this talk. And you can see there's a huge discrepancy as has been seen with other uh, PDF sets. But so after we did that, we actually took those results and added in CITIS transverse momentum dependent data included in the fit. And when we did that, the solid line is, the, is everything that was included in the JAM20 CITIS fit plus the QT dependent CITIS data. And you can see that it, provides a, a significant improvement in the data. And then the dashed line shown is what happens if we just fit the CITIS, compass CITIS data alone instead of the big simultaneous fit that we had done. So in conclusion, uh, we've successfully performed simultaneous global extraction of PDFs and fragmentation functions, which, all, which includes the char unidentified charged hadrons. Um, we've observed similar strange PDF suppression as was observed by the JAP-19 fits. And uh, a comparison of fixed order predictions using, using these results to uh, compass transverse momentum dependent data shows that there is still a large discrepancy. But we have found that including that transverse momentum data in, in, to, in the fit actually does reduce the discrepancy significantly. So thank you. Thank you very much for a nice talk. So we have uh, Amanda first with a question, please. You just go back two slides. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, you've said that with the SIA data, you get what Jam 19 got, but on this plot, you're showing the RS ratio for SIA and, and CIDIS. And the nature of the, you know, where you get the good chi squares is clearly opposite in those two. Do you have any understanding of that? 
Right, you are correct. The CITES uh, does does go, but the the, the range of the CITES uh, chi squares it was much smaller, and it's a lot closer to one than the SIA data. So the significant improvement we feel of SIA the, of the SIA fits as since it's larger in magnitude and it gets a lot closer to one. We felt that that was. Uh, Okay, you think it's more reliable. It just it, it's interesting that the CIDIS is the other way because I, I think we saw something yesterday as well about a, a, a newer jam fit which had a um, strangeness ratio close to unity. I, I guess that was the CIDIS results. So, mm. yeah. Right, thanks, that's fine. Are you? Yes, hello, thanks. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, I've got a couple of questions, one of which is actually connected with what Amanda has just uh, said. So concerning this particular plot, um, something that I find kind of uh, uh, fun is the fact that uh, at least for, uh, uh, for a couple of them, I see two separate bunches of uh, curves. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you have an explanation for that? Why, why do you see that clustering? There, there could be favored uh, just favored clustering. Uh, I mean, it's a Monte Carlo approach, so there could be different sets of minimums depending on where you start in the parameter space. And so there could be, uh, All right. they, yeah. they could form different shapes. <clears throat> All right, but I mean, only one of them can be the, the absolute uh, minimum, right? So- True. Uh, or, or, or possibly not even, uh, uh, one of them. Uh, so, do, do 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 you do you have? Uh, I don't know. Is, is there is there anything that perhaps uh, you 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 could be doing about that? Because of course, having uh, um, relative minima in, in your in your feeds is probably not not a good idea. You're not uh, you're not uh, getting the right uh, result. Well, we could use a uh, like k-means clustering to try to uh, group the replicas together and then. But usually as a Monte Carlo fit, you, you want to include all the replicas to ensure that the parameter space is fully explored. All right. Okay, right. Um, and I've got another question, if I may. Um, uh, yeah, as uh, again, uh, Amanda, as, as Mandy has as, uh, as, uh, mentioned before, uh, yesterday you have seen another talk uh, by uh, Chris uh, uh, Kutza, and he, he, was, he was showing uh, a fit of uh, PDFs only. And in uh, some comparison plots, it was showing some, some discrepancy at the level of PDFs between the feed that you have presented and uh, the, P the feed of uh, PDFs only. Uh, and then uh, you have also shown in, in, your, in your slides that um, uh, this, this particular feed helps a lot uh, uh, reproduce the CDS data. Um, is there anything you can you can say about? I mean, do, do, do you do, did you did you manage to um, I mean to ask because there must be some some, some degree of tension between uh, possibly CDS data and, and and data that is only sensitive to, to BDFs. Um, yeah. Is is there is there any any uh, so did you manage to single that out in the sense that there is the discrepancy that you see between between the PDFs without CDS data? And we see this data um, are so different because of CDs, or, or is there is another another reason? Well, I actually think it's probably because of the inclusion of the SIA data. So the SIA data seems to be, as we can see in this graph, this, the SIA data seems to want the S bar K plus fragmentation function to be larger. Mm -hmm. And so when CDs data is included in order to get the same theoretical prediction, if there's a larger S-bar fragmentation function, then there's gonna be a smaller S-bar uh, PDF. All right, all right. So it's it's really the interplay between, uh, so yeah, because I mean, of course, uh, CI data does, doesn't depend on, on PDFs. So it's really right. really the, the, the effect of C on fragmentation functions that in turn uh, cause uh, an effect on PDFs through CDs. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, all right. Very quickly, Pavel. Yeah. So uh, th th thank you for this interesting talk. So you work at a very uh, pretty low Q squared values, and of course, CDS is quite sensitive to high order corrections. So what do you do about high right. order dependence? Our, we restricted our data to Q squared above four and W squared above ten. So, but 
But yes, and eventually we should be including uh, lower energies and uh, target mass corrections. But, but also there is an NLO correction, which is quite large. Well, this is NLO. I don't think uh, I said that, but this is an NLO calculation. Okay, but would be interesting to see if this uh, predictions change uh, if you vary the scale for the, in the NLO cross section. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Further questions to Eric, please, on the chat. I already asked him something. Uh, we move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Lucian Harlan Lang, who will be Hi. talking about physics from photons at the LHC. Is that all good? Yep. Perfect. Um, great. Yeah. Thank you very much um, uh, for the opportunity to speak about this. Um, yeah. So indeed, I'm going to be talking about physics from photons at the LHC. Uh, so just to motivate that a little bit. Um, so first of all, yeah, the LHC is, of course, officially in the Precision Electro Week race. Um, and it goes without saying that the dilepton final state is sort of key in that, uh, you know, whether it be W mass measurement, sine squared theta W, um, but of course, with specific relevance for this working group PDFs, of course, the Drell-Yan process, um, as you would typically call it, is, is, is crucial there. And that, of course, feeds into these above electroweak measurements as well, and they're all connected. So a key element in that, obviously, we want to get the theory under good control is to understand this photon initiated uh, mechanism. So that's what I'm going to say a little bit about. And, and, you know, the basic point here is that, of course, NNLO QCD is the standard. And so these sort of things are very much relevant. Uh, so I'll focus on that, um, but in the last sort of few minutes, we'll just sort of advertise or mention um, a um, something a little bit different, um, which perhaps is less directly relevant to this working group, but is still certainly interesting, which is the possibility of not just looking at inclusive production, uh, but also looking um, with protons being tagged. So. Um, the idea here is that if you've got photon initiated production, yes, that can be there as a component of your inclusive signal, but also it's a color singlet object. So it can leave the protons intact and you can tag them. And we've got very nice measurements precisely with that from Atlas and CMS, but also, you know, you can select with rapidity gaps and so on. And so you've got this clean, almost pure QED process, this possibility of using the LHC as a photon photon collider, uh, which in particular allows you to probe all sorts of standard model and BSM physics provided some some links, some references there to that. But okay, focusing on the inclusive side um, and what we know about that. So, I mean, the bottom line here is that this, this story about the photon PDF is, is already becoming a, a kind of very well established one. Um, and, and historically there were large uncertainties, but we now have this Lux QED formalism uh, which, which tells us that we can get a photon PDF out with very good uncertainty. So, you know, the bottom line here is that the classic way you'd want to model this process is by collinear factorization, a, a gamma gamma to lepton pair subprocess cross section. A leading order, these would be on shell and collinear, and then PDFs of the photons within the proton. And the Lux QED point is that you can relate those photon PDFs directly to the structure functions, which are measured in, in lepton proton scattering, which are known precisely, and therefore the PDF is known precisely. Um, the issue here is that, of course, a PDF is not an observable, and a cross section is an observable. And so a high precision determination of the photon PDF does not automatically translate to a high precision. Uh, prediction for an observable, of course. And you know the, the, the way we get a handle on that is that there's this factorization scale variation in, in the PDFs and at leading order, no such can, you know, no variation in the actual cross section and therefore essentially a very large leading order type uh, scale uncertainty. So this is plotting the gamma gamma component of this to the QCD Drell Yan in the lower mass region. And the only thing to focus on is the red band, which is the uncertainty from scale variation, factorization scale variation in the leading order uh, process to precisely this diagram. Now, okay, so what? You know, that's of course very well known. You'd have that in QCD. The answer would be to calculate to higher order, right? And then you get a more convergent result. And the answer, of course, you could do that. But the only point I want to raise is that for this particular process in particular, there is an alternative way. So what is that? Um, well, indeed, what one can call out a structure function calculation. So the alternative is to apply that such a such a calculation directly as it is in sort of VBF, for example, VBF Higgs, uh, but to do it to photon initiated production. So 
as we well know, the structure functions parameterize all the physics in the kind of photon proton vertex, that bottom vertex there. And therefore, of course, very well, as very, very old physics. One can write, for example, the DIS cross section in terms of the leptonic and the hadronic tensor in that way. And the hadronic tensor, of course, is given in terms of the structure functions. Um, so, and the idea is just to take that and apply it to the, to the proton proton case. So we have this expression here, we have an integral over the momentum fractions, but also the virtualities of the photons. It's just a phase space integral, essentially. One has amplitudes for the gamma gamma to lepton pair uh, process, and one has these rows. And these rows essentially are, are playing the role of the Ws here. Um, and, and they're directly given in terms of the structure functions. So it's just a direct analog of that, that breakdown applied to the proton proton case. So what are the uncertainties in such a, in such a calculation? Um, well, first of all, there's the experimental uncertainties. And the bottom line here is that the experimental inputs, uh, if you want to call them that, are precisely the same as the ones that go into a Lux QED style photon PDF. In other words, it's the structure functions, right, that are measured in lepton proton scattering, elastic scattering, inelastic scattering, but also at low Q squared and, and in, in the resonance region, all of that stuff, one just directly inputs it, and also in the DIS region. So those are known as sort of broadly speaking percent level precision, and so therefore that is the uncertainty that comes from them. Yes, of course, there are higher order QED corrections to gamma gamma to lepton pair, um, and crucially non-factorizable uh, either NNLO QCD corrections, which would connect the two beams, or NLO electroweak corrections to this, which would also connect the beams, which should be percent level as well. So broadly speaking, just by doing this calculation directly, one gets percent level or maybe even less uncertainty directly in the observable, in the cross section. And there is no factorization scale here because there is no photon, there is no PDF. Um, so you know, what is the relationship then to the, to the, to the collinear PDF formalism? Um, I've already kind of hinted that they're, they're clearly related, that they, you know, they use the same experimental input, and that's certainly the case. So how do you go from, from the structure function result to the, to, the, to the collinear result? Well, one simply expands. And so the key point here is that this process here in collinear factorization, the photons are on shell and collinear, whereas you know, this full uh, prediction, one has, as I say, a, an integral over the photon Q squares, and that's the key point. If one took this full result and one expanded it in the photon virtuality over the invariant mass of the, the dielepton, let's say, the leading term would be precisely what you get in the leading order collinear result. But of course, there are higher order terms in that. So the factorization scale in that collinear prediction is essentially telling you about the lack of control over those Q squared over ML squared um, terms. Now, again, of course, one can go to NLO in, this, in, the, in the collinear calculation. That will give you non-zero photon Q squared, of course, uh, and one will get an improved result. But the point is all you're doing is really unpacking what's already contained in the structure function. It's not a kind of genuine NLO correction in the sort of QCD sense where you don't know it till you calculate it. This will just get you back closer to what you have by just calculating with the left-hand side directly, if you like. So, so this is all... Um, uh, kind of implemented in this Monte Carlo SF Gen, which is um, available on HEPForge, and then there's a paper to to go with all of this as well. So just to advertise that, but let me flash up a few results. Um, so again, this is the the ratio of the photon initiated lepton pair production cross section to the QCD gel Yang prediction in different invariant mass regions, so low Z peak and and high. Uh, and again, you've got the structure, the um, sorry, the collinear leading order result with its scale variation, and then the structure function result, which has the genuine uh, experimental uncertainty from the structure functions shown in it. So they're only really visible, even at high mass. Uh, and yes, um, for the purposes of this talk, one can, there are some details about the difference between the dashed and the solid line, but, but, but that, that's not too relevant here. So the first point is certainly you need NLO if you're gonna continue to use the um, photon PDF for the calculation of dielepton production. Um, but again, you can get that sort of for free in, in, in the structure function calculation directly. And the other point to make is that clearly these are these are sizable contributions, as is well known, other, other than on the Z peak, where of course they're kind of relatively suppressed. 
Ammon can go triple differential. It just all kind of comes out naturally. So there's, of course, lots of data on this, nice atlas data most recently on, on um, triple differential in the invariant mass rapidity and also angular distributions of the leptons. And this is sensitive to both PDFs and sine squared theta w. Well, clearly you want to get that correctly. So this is just in the higher mass bin in different bins of cos theta. And it's the same thing as before the ratio to the QCD. And you can see the kind of precise predictions you get and the, the, the larger uncertainties from the leading order collinear results. So clearly um, there's a kind of interplay here between PDFs and sine squared theta W and it, it clearly needs to be controlled. This photon initiated part should be controlled properly um, to get that accurately, if you like. And certainly as data becomes more precise, that's gonna become more important. Um, a few other things one can, one can get the, again, the photons have non-zero Q squared, so they have non-zero PT. So one can get the photon initiated contribution to, for example, the dilepton PT distribution comes out automatically. That's of course zero at leading order in the collinear prediction. Um, so I won't go through the details of that, but just to say you can do that. I think what is interesting is the lower plot, which is that uh, the structure function prediction takes you right down to low PT where the of the dilepton, where there's a big enhancement, for example, from elastic photon emission, um, where the emit photons are actually emitted elastically from the protons, and that happens dominantly at low Q squared and hence low PT dilepton. So this is again plotting the ratio to the Drell Yan, this is the resummed Drell Yan uh, QCD prediction. And the point is, if you look at the dashed line, even on the Z peak in the very lowest bin, it's starting to get to almost the, the percent level, um, even there. And so, for example, in W mass determination, where this sort of dilepton data might be tuned to, it could even be relevant there. So I can flash up a, a kind of a plot to, to make that point. It's a little bit busy. So if you focus on the, the left plot, let's say, what am I showing here? I'm looking at the dilepton uh, uh, data or dilepton, sorry, predictions uh, and imagining or kind of kind of quantifying the amount to which their shapes shift either by varying the Z mass by the sort of amounts one wants to be sensitive to in the W mass case. So that takes you to these solid and, and dashed lines um, or in terms of the lepton PT distribution and also looking at the effect on the shape of including the photon initiated. And the point here is that if that's not included correctly, one would potentially tune it away when one then goes to look at W data. So, I mean, the effect is rather small, probably going to be marginal in the end, but it's an interesting thing to look at, let's say. Okay, so in the last sort of few minutes, uh, let me say something uh, briefly about uh, a kind of alternative application of this, which is to exclusive data. Um, so again, the idea here is that the, the protons can either remain intact or, or dissociate, and, 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 in, and in the latter case, one would look for the cases where there are rapidity gaps in the final state, so no extra kind of MPI, if you like. Uh, and the point here is that one just has ready-made the formalism to do this. So these again, these rows depend on the structure functions, and so if you're looking at purely elastic production, one just picks out the elastic structure functions or a combination of the inelastic and the elastic if one wants single dissociation or of course both, both inelastic if one wants double dissociation. Um, and so one, one, we, we, can, we can implement that, we can write a Monte Carlo for it, we can produce events, pass them to, to Pythia which can then do the showering and the hadronization and then that's it, you have a particle level you know Monte Carlo uh, for such processes and this allows you to simulate the case where the protons are intact, but also where they dissociate and perhaps experimentally you ask for some region in rapidity where, where there's no extra particle production and one can then evaluate the extent to which this dissociation system at kind of larger and varying masses might lead you to, to fail that veto and, and so on and so forth. Um, so one other complication that is worth mentioning, and which I hinted at before, which is that this sort of factorized expression here ignores the fact that the protons themselves can interact in addition. And if you're asking that the protons are intact or that there are rapidity gaps there, if there's extra inelastic proton-proton interactions, extra MPI, if you like, as sort of shown by this, this diagram on the right, that will spoil that requirement. And so you need to really include a survival factor, as it's called, a probability of of no additional inelastic hadron hadron interactions. Two minutes. Right. Um, now, in principle, that's 
a very complicated thing to calculate. You know, protons like to interact, so that survival factor would be very low for a sort of generic interaction, and it would certainly be a model-dependent thing to calculate. But photon-initiated production is sort of very special in that sense, and the reason for that, is particular for the elastic case, is that if this is an elastic emission, the photon virtuality, as I've mentioned, has to be very low, um, or that you know, or the proton will essentially re won't remain intact. Uh, and if you think about that in terms of the impact parameter of the colliding protons, that corresponds, um, you know, these are Fourier conjugates of each other, essentially, that corresponds to large impact parameters. So actually, most of this sort of collision event happens at impact parameters that are actually well outside the range of QCD. And so there, the, the probability of extra proton-proton interactions would essentially be zero. Okay, life's not quite that simple. It, there is some chance that it can happen, but it's generally low and the survival factor is, is of order one, let's say. And so it's in that sense that one can talk about using the LHC as a photon-photon collider. So the devil's in the detail. This is all included in, in our Monte Carlo. Um, and, you know, this is process dependent. It depends on whether the protons break up or not. If they break up, if, they, if this is a, sorry, an inelastic photon emission, then the survival factor tends to be lower. Um, and, that, and it also depends on kinematics. So just to flash up a couple of results before finishing, one can get out of, a, of the Monte Carlo um, the, the, for the dielepton production, the survival factor versus either the invariant mass or the rapidity of the dielepton. So just focusing on the top case, one sees that for elastic production, it's of order one. For single dissociative, it's also of order one. For double dissociative, on the other hand, you tend to get extra MPI. And also it depends on kinematics. Um, and that's all there is to say there. And finally, one can compare actually to very nice Atlas data, selecting precisely this final state, lepton pairs, veto on extra charge tracks. This is the actual data compared to the, uh, for the acoplanarity distributions that basically measures how back to back the electrons or the muons are. And there are our predictions seem to be doing pretty well. Perhaps some hints with more recent data that there's some discrepancies. So certainly lots to look at. And that's all in this uh, super chip Monte Carlo. So let me finish there. And, and the, the, before kind of letting you just read this, let me, the one thing I want to emphasize for the inclusive case is that this is certainly complementary to the photon PDF. It, it, I would argue it's the best thing to do for this sort of dielectron production, but for mixed channels, uh, for example, where the photon can split into a QQ bar, it's much less clear that this is the thing to use. And certainly you, you need to have QED corrections to deglap. Uh, and that needs a photon PDF. So they're complementary things. Uh, but on the other hand, for maybe exclusive production, this is the sort of definite way to go. There's lots of applications for the future, but let me finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Do we have any questions? Just a moment. Okay, Nabua, go ahead. Hi, Lucian. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, so I, I understand that you know, your approach is to capitalize on, on the elastic uh, structure functions, mm -hmm. um, which in turn, I think that it also depends on QED corrections when they are trying to be an extractor from data, right? Yes, that's right. So the question, it, it, there is some kind of a chicken and egg problem that I, that I kind of see. So the question is how confident you, you think, you, you know, it is a situation, you know, owing to the fact that, you know, the elastic, you know, uh, you know, factor is, is really, you know, a, not a direct measurement, but something extracted from also QED corrections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good, definitely a, a valid point. I mean, so, I mean, it depends on the particular extraction. Sometimes those um, higher order QED effects are kind of subtracted off or they're not or so on. So essentially, I think you would trust this up to those sort of corrections on it. But that would be a higher order QED effect on what's already a QED process. So that's that goes into that percent level uncertainty I talked about. Indeed, we actually include in what we call the experimental uncertainty, different kind of um, extractions of the elastic uh, form factors, which I think even to some extent may account for differences in approaches due to that. But you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's not unique in, in lepton proton scattering. You don't just have the single photon exchange clearly. So there is an uncertainty due to that, but it's safe for our, for these purposes under pretty good control. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Then we move forward to our next speaker, Felix Heckhorn, who will talk about the uh, can MSPAR part distribution functions be negative? 
Okay, so uh, thanks and thanks for giving me the opportunity to present the content of a paper that was written by Alessandro Candido, Stefano Forte and myself last summer, where indeed we posed the question, can MS bar distributions be negative? And this has been a long-standing problem as it was known that in practice, PDFs can indeed go negative and especially at large X. And as we already heard in this session and basically also in the conference uh, earlier, the large X is becoming an interesting topic. And for example, as you can see the strange quark here for the NNPDF 3.1 release, the thing can indeed go negative. And this can be a problem because we want to have physical cross sections always. And especially this can be a problem for BSM physics because typically these processes will require a large amount of energy and hence will probe the PDFs at large X. All right, to lay out the argument, let's take a look at TIS. We know that structure functions are given as a convolution between coefficient functions and PDFs. And structure functions are indeed observables and hence positive. So it is immediately clear that as long as the coefficient function are in some sense positive, one can choose in fact positive PDFs. And indeed, if we think about the leading order case, this is exactly true, because in leading order, we know that structure functions are PDF, and hence there would never be a problem. But the situation changes if we look at next to leading order, which is shown in the two plots below here. And I will call the left-hand side the diagonal channels, which in, in DIS is the quark initiated contribution. On the right-hand side, there's a gluon initiated uh, case, and I will call this the off-diagonal channel. And if we focus for the moment on the MS bar curve, which is the green curve, and look on the left, we can see that the green curve is hidden behind the multicolor line. And the important thing is there is no problem. The coefficient function is simply positive all over. So there's no problem in the diagonal channel. However, on the right-hand side, in the gluon case, the thing can indeed go negative, and especially can go negative if we are looking near threshold. OK, so let's take a closer look at the gluon MS bar coefficient function, which is given by this formula here, which hopefully everybody knows. And as you can see, there's this logarithm of 1 minus z. And indeed, this is the culprit. So this thing can go negative if we are approaching threshold. But then you wonder, OK, how come in the first place? Because of course, the bare unsubtracted coefficient function has no such a problem, because it is defined by a modulus squared and is given by the forward uh, shown above. And as you can easily verify, this thing is positive all over the place, so there's no problem. And hence, we conclude the problem must be hidden inside the factorization scheme. And indeed, MS bar takes its name for a reason, because it does the subtraction at the most minimal scale, at the most naive factorization scale, if you wish, which in this case is Q squared. But now, if you compare this factorization scale to the scale which is natural in the process, you can see they are not the same because the natural scale of the process is the partonic center of mass energy S due to phase space, of course. And then you know that there's a, the phase space S is given by facing the Q squared times one minus set. This means that the natural scale is always smaller than Q squared. And hence, MS bar amounts to an over subtraction and that's the reason why the thing does go negative. Of course, we can solve this problem by simply defining a new factorization scheme where we now subtract at the correct scale, for example, at S divided by four. And if we do subtract the poles at this new scale, we indeed obtain a positive coefficient functions which are positive all over the place. And we can consider this a good scheme because now we are able to choose positive PDFs. However, we can uh, attribute this new scale with some more physical information because this new scale is in fact given by the maximum transverse momentum of the splitting parton, which in this case, of course, is the quark. And hence, we have uh, some more information uh, attributed to the scale. We can consider this even a physical scale. And then you can remember there are other physical scales, for example, the IS. And indeed, in the IS, there would never have been such a problem because by definition, 
the DIS gluon coefficient function is zero because here structure functions simply remain at their leading order definition, meaning PDFs. Since the first is positive, also the latter is positive, there would never have been such a problem. However, also our DPOS scheme is a good scheme because we have here positive coefficient functions. And what we will need to do is to take a look at the scheme transformation matrix that now connect the new DPOS scheme and the true and response. Before doing this, we have to take a slight detour because we have to take a look at the hadronic processes and we will have to do two things in parallel. We have to look at the quark initiated process for which we can take, for example, Jolian shown on the top. And we have to take a look at the gluon initiated processes for which we can take the Higgs shown on the bottom case. However, the main arguments of the story remain completely true and analog. That is the diagonal case shown always to the left here is not a problem. All coefficient functions are positive in the first place. The off-diagonal case always shown to the right for Drolyan being the blue initiated channel and for Higgs being the quark initiated channel, we can see that indeed the coefficient functions can go negative and they can go negative if we're approaching threshold. And we can apply the same solution that we also found in the DIS case. We can subtract at a new scale and the new scale again is given by the maximum transverse momentum of the splitting parton. However, in the hadronic case, this is given by Q squared times one minus Z squared, basically. And if you remember the DIS case, you can see there's an additional factor of one minus Z, which means that this new scale, and this is the true positivity scheme that we define, is in fact smaller than the deep scales. And this means that we can also use this scale, the positivity scale, in the DIS case. Because in the DIS case, this will simply amount to an under subtraction. But under subtraction is not a problem. The thing will simply go even more positive. And now that we have our process independent scheme, which is the positivity scheme, we can now take a look at these scheme transformation matrix K, which I said are given just by the difference between the coefficient functions. Now, as promised, K is the scheme change, and indeed the MS bar PDF is given by the inverse of the scheme change, which is given by one plus alpha K basically times in this case, the positivity PDFs. And the scheme change can be graphically represented by a plot, which is shown here, where we do show the third singlet moment against the third gluon moment. And the scheme change is represented by the arrows which are indicated in this plot. And what you can see the scheme change will do, it will push the PDFs in an even more positive reach. However, since in the positivity scheme, we have positive PDFs in the first place, also MS bar PDFs are even more positive. And hence we conclude our argument, MS bar PDFs are in fact positive. There's a small caveat here, um, if, Z is smaller than one, that is if we are away from threshold, we can use the perturbative inverse. Um, but if you are close to the threshold, we have to use the exact inverse. However, this is not a problem, we can do it. And the argument still remains the same. It is pushed in an even more positive direction. We conclude our argument, MS bar PDS are in fact positive. Now, to obtain a physical cross-section, is positivity sufficient? And the answer is no. Reason being is that while any quote unquote true PDF does in fact hold the positivity property, any approximation thereof, that is any fitted approximation thereof, does not necessarily hold this property and hence we cannot conclude sufficient. And then you wonder, is it that even necessary to obtain physical cross-section? And again, the answer is no, because with basically proof by example, we can show that even PDF, which are slightly negative, convoluted with a sufficiently good coefficient function, always yield positive cross-section. And so the thing is not even necessary. Okay, and then you wonder what did we gain in the first place if this is neither necessary nor sufficient? Well, we still gained the proof actually that PDFs are positive in the first place. And so what we can do, we can use this information to apply an additional cut when we are fitting 
and to make the PDF space that we're exploring even smaller. And in fact, this is what the NNN PDF 4.0 release, which is the upcoming release, will do. So this is a slide which I've taken from Tomas Ojani from his PDF 4 LC talk. And what you can see the, in practice is done, the fitting people will add some penalty term to their chi-squared. And the penalty term basically simply denies the PDF from going negative. And in practice, you can see uh, two examples shown on the bottom here. On the left, the um, um, SBAR PDF, and on the right, a DBAR with and without positivity. And if you can see, if you impose positivity, then first of all, the thing does indeed go positive, as it ought to be. And it also improves the fitting quality because the arrow indeed shrinks. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. Questions to Felix? Go ahead. Okay, hi Felix. So I have a quick question. So is it fair to say that your proof that the PDF is positive is tied to the actual DIS reaction? So you're using DIS as a mechanism to formally prove that PDF has to be positive. Is that a fair statement? No, the statement is process independent. So the process, the statement is, so factorization schemes have to be process independent in the first place. So we, the, I have the, so the thing is true for all schemes and um, the case of DIS is just, just a simple one because in the DIS, of course, there's a linear dependency only on the PDF, but we can still play this game on the hadronic case. And indeed we have to play this on the hadronic case because we will, we would use we would use exactly this scheme, which is defined by this scale here, with this important square here. Um, only this um, correctly uh, renormalizes the hadronic cases, or correctly factorizes, correctly saying, the PDFs in the hadronic case. And simply this scheme, this scale also works for the DIS case, because in the DIS case, this just amounts, as I said, to an under subtraction. So the thing is process independent. So this is where I, I do have a trouble because formally the, the you know the actual um, you know scale of the you know that appears in the PDF comes from a UV divergence, so it's not bounded by any kinematical factor. So to me, you know, it seems that the proof of the, of what you're justifying is tied to specific kinematics when the PDF on its own lives formally you know, at the correlator level with the renormalization factors that it only renormalizes in the UV divergence. Hence, I don't see that proof really, you know, to be like a absolute need in QFT. That's, that's my comment. Okay. Um, I don't know if I can quickly reply. First of all, we, the, in the paper, all the details should be laid out. And second, so what we, what we prove is process independent. So I'm not sure. So, and for example, this argument does hold at any uh, factorization scale. So the, the trick with the changing the scale is just an intermediate step, just showing from that we can indeed construct a scheme. But the final result of the proof is that MS bar is positive. So if you wish, the, the, the scheme is uh, playing with scales it's just uh, uh, to help the argument. If this answers your question. Hi, Ignacio. Uh, yes, hello. Um, okay, I got. I think I got your argument. I think it's a nice argument, but uh, there is a, another issue with scale, and it is uh, say the convergence. Uh, say. Changing uh, the this is a scale. Uh, say does changing this scale improve the convergence of the PDF when going from next reading order to next to next reading order, for instance? So do you have a really a better result when you have a fit out of this? Um, so what we are doing is not fitting in the in our new scheme. 
the positivity scheme is a valid factorization scheme for sure. We could provide PDFs in this positivity scheme. However, we are not doing it because the proof results in the fact that MS bar PDFs are positive. And hence we will continue what the community is doing and always provide MS bar PDFs. However, for example, in this positivity scheme, um, we think, although we not invested investigated this deeply, that in this positivity scheme, for example, resumation would be built in because exactly what the scheme does, it removes these types of logs, which are typical in uh, resumation. So if you would uh, provide PDFs in uh, the say positivity scheme, they would first of all look different. And second, they would automatically include some um, resumation. But we are Hopefully. not using the positivity scheme for PDFs. So you, you are not able at this stage to check if uh, uh, well, yeah, and any convergence of the PDF with perturbative order, as far as I understand. Mm, as, as said, in the, the fitting will still be done in MS bar. Okay. The, the PDFs will be delivered and the, the, the coefficient functions in the, the intermediate results will all computed in MS bar because the, this is, we, we don't need to do anything. We prove that MS bar is positive and hence we can stay by uh, what we done before and I always provide MS bar. But it would be fair and it would be possible to use other schemes as same as you could provide your PDFs in the IS scheme or whatever scheme you, 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 you like. Thank you. Okay, uh, so Rava, really, really quickly. <laughs> Very quick, just um, uh, maybe one thing to clarify is that when you say MS bar is positive is uh, from a specific scale, right? Where this, uh, where this is true. No, because the, the proof does not Im include any specific scale. And second, DGLAB always will preserve positivity. So- I'm, t I'm talking about MS bar, right? Um, yes. Yes, yes. So the, 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 this argument holds at an arbitrary scale, basically on relying on the fact that at, at arbitrary scale, you can divide such a relation that structure, that the thing is a, the observable is a PDF. And, and when you have, once you have defined such a thing, DGLAB will preserve your positivity. Okay, I need to think about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Further questions to Felix, please, on the chat. Now we go to the last talk in this session. The will please share your slides. Do you see my screen? Yep. All right. Uh, say it again. Go full screen. Uh, that's as full as I can get. Is that too small? No, no, it's OK. I just see your <laughs> uh, whatever. OK, go ahead. All right. Well, f thanks for uh, allowing me to present this talk. So I'm going to be discussing um, some new uh, new discussion about uh, QED corrections in. Sorry. Can I go? Okay. Um, so let me just uh, show you the motivation of of this research. And the idea is that uh, we really enter into a new, the next frontier of hadron structure uh, using semi-inclusive DIS. And we are moving from existing experiment, past experiments, existing experiments, and of course the future is in the EIC. And this is thanks to the ability to be able to tag a hadron in the final state in the EP scattering, where we can define now two planes uh, and then these planes can dance each other uh, relative to the spin vector, producing uh, um, basically angular modulations. And these angular modulations allows us to basically uh, uh, define 18 structure functions uh, using um, basically uh, properties of, of the hyaluronic tensor for cities. And each of, in some of them, that all, all of these uh, uh, structure functions that are listed here, uh, display the factorization theorem where you can actually uh, access basically a very rich structure of the nucleons such as transversities, sievers, bone molders, and so on and so forth. 
And, uh, and you can see that this is thanks to the various modulations that exist in these coefficients in front of the structured functions. Um, so at the core of these factorization theorems lies a very important ingredient, which is the need to use the Bry frame, okay? So factorization theorems are actually justified only in that frame where the photon is head-to-head -head collision with the proton. And it is assumed that experimentally this photon is always event by event along the z-axis. And then the transverse momentum that you observe in the final state for the, from the outgoing hadron uh, is basically always relative to that. So the question, you know, the, you know, this ability to define the PT of the hadron and the rapidity in this bright frame allows us to, you know, to explore a very rich uh, 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 um, um, structures in cities involving TMDs, involving collinear parts, involving target fra uh, fragmentations, all within this, you know, very complicated uh, structure of the nucleon. However, as I mentioned, it relies on this idea that you can put the photon on the z-axis. Uh, and the question is, is that really true? Is that really true that event by event and experimental measurements of the outgoing electron can you know, really put the photon on the z-axis? And of course, what happens if this incoming and outgoing electron radiates? Will this Q, you know, the Q vector to be always on, on the on the z-axis? Of course, that's a question. And so naturally the answer is no, because if the if the incoming outgoing electrons radiate, you really don't know where the photon goes. So, so the point here, you know, the, the key message that you want to take from my talk is that the so-called experimental bright frame does not need to coincide with the true bright frame where factorization theorem operates. So how to proceed uh, is, list, is more or less outlined in this paper with my collaborators, Tiambo and Wally and Janwe from JLab. And um, for people who work on factorization theorems, you can sort of think the reaction amplitude where you have the incoming electron and outgoing electron and so on and so forth. And you are tempted to somehow start building up the QED corrections using RG improved calculations. So, so we want to include something, for instance, the electron in electron uh, uh, a part on density, which we call the lepton distribution function, or the electron in electron fragmentation, which what we call LFFs. Now, I have to admit, we are not the first people who have thought about this idea of implementing our um, RG improved calculation in electron. Uh, a proton scattering, but we are addressing the main question is what happened for semi-inclusive DAS. So there is an interesting observation when, when I'm talking about these LDFs and LFFs, you know, the natural question is, you know, should we also need to design, you know, transverse momentum degrees for the outgoing electron and incoming electron? Um, and so we did a quick a study uh, where we just basically took the leptonic tensor and apply basically standard CSS uh, technique to be able to resum uh, logarithms of the transverse momentum. So you can see, for those who are familiar with the CSS formalism, you can see here uh, the uh, small BT approximation along with the Sura curve. And then this part here are the collinear, you know, is a completely analogous thing in QCD, like the collinear PDS and collinear fragmentation functions. And the key observation is, do, do we really need to actually go into this route with all this complicated stuff? And so a very quick calculation of this uh, W, uh, um, this um, basically uh, this part uh, that resumes the logarithms of the transverse momentum in, in coordinate space, you can see immediately that the distribution is very broad. You, you can see that the number here dies off around 10 to the minus three, right? So of course, if you, you know, if you follow the logic of Fourier transforms, this would mean that in the co in the momentum space, this uh, this uh, this object will peak around QT equal to zero. If you don't believe me, here is a calculation uh, or the numerics where you can see that the transverse momentum is highly localized 
the transverse momentum distribution is highly localized as very small QT. So what this means is that basically using TMDs for this LDFs and LFS is an overkill. We probably don't need to use that. So, so the question is, okay, that means that we can just rely on collinear uh, radiation for the LDFs and LFFs. And so let's try to see how do we implement this uh, uh, technology. So basically we have this remarkable formula for the 18 structure functions. I'm going to focus on the first one, the unpolarized uh, structure function. I'm going to see how we can incorporate the QED corrections on top of that. Uh, and then, you know, the, natu the natural thinking is, well, we just have to convolute with the LDF, the collinear LDFs and the collinear F LFFs uh, along with the, you know, the QCD part. So every single term that is inside of here are going to be subject to different momentum fractions coming from the LDFs and LFFs. Um, and so, and there is an important element here is that since we don't know where the photon goes, um, in principle, we should not know what is the factorization theorem. However, since we have the ability to control, you know, this QED radiation, it means that we can always rotate uh, point by point in the radiation into a frame where the photon is fully on the correct direction that we, we want to apply factorization. And so basically what it translates to this is that the transverse momentum that we are actually using, you know, uh, have, sees this QED rotational effects. Um, now, so in principle, you can implement this formally in a, in a numerical calculation with some input FUU. Um, but of course, it's easier to say than to, to, uh, uh, to do. So somehow, uh, ah, okay. So uh, this collinear LDFs and LFS has an ordinary uh, uh, correlation, a correlation function definition. And of course, you have to renormalize it. And then the renormalization will give you ordinary DGLAB because it's basically follow the same logic as in QCD. And then you can also calculate them. So you can take a couple of diagrams here to be able to calculate a leading order and next to leading order this uh, input scale LF LDFs and LFFs. Now, uh, notice that these are basically distributional leading order. And this is actually kind of a little bit problematic in terms of the numerical implementation, but we figure out uh, 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 this is just an illustration that after you evolve these LDFs with DGLAB, you can see that the distribution actually moves away from the delta function that sits at x equal to one, and it radiates, you know, with these tails. Of course, uh, uh, we here we are also evolving with the singlet evolution, and we show that basically the photon contribution is tiny. So basically, the non-singlet contribution is the only thing that I'm worried here at the moment. But the problem is that it's still this thing peaks very badly. And, and so one needs to have a very clever way to implement this thing numerically. So we envision a way to do this using a subtraction trick. I don't have much time to explain this, but basically, you, you know, you just subtract the piece that, you know, is difficult to calculate and add up and compute this thing exactly. So, you know, if you, if you have a question, I can ask, ask you later how to this subtraction trick works. So, uh, the point here is that we can actually use this trick to render the calculation uh, uh, numerically stable. And with this, I have the following plot where this is basically the cities with kinematics that I'm listing here. Um, no QED over QED corrections um, for different Q square values. And what you can see here is if you follow the solid line, uh, the corrections are actually very sizable. In fact, this is, you know, by the way, there are other literature that also have shown this kind of effect. So this is really real. And one of the things that we did here is the, the role of the rotational effects of the transverse momentum. So because if I go back here into my formulae, um, I can really fix this PT to be the, the actual PT that experimentalists measure versus allowing to radiate. Uh, and then subtracting that, you can actually see that most of the effects of the QED comes from this rotational effect of the PT distribution. So this is this tells me that basically the QED corrections are very important and needs to be taken into account in studies of semi-inclusive DIS. So just to finish it up my talk, um, let me just flash another aspect of this, which is about the spin structures. So I'm just using 
you know, as I said, you know, the, you know, the next generation of, of, of hydrogen structure is because, you know, we can actually access other exotic things beyond ordinary collinear PDFs. We can have transversities and sievers, right? And then here I'm listing, you know, an analysis that I was involved recently. And what I want to do is to basically take these extractions uh, to compute the sievers asymmetry and the Collins asymmetry and see how the, uh, how the QED effects play a role in these asymmetries. So one thing that you can see here is that I'm going to focus on these two structure functions that are sensitive to the transverse momentum of the, uh, sorry, the transverse spin of the hadron. okay? And notice that this spin is basically in the Bright frame because this whole formula is written in the Bright frame. Now, if I actually wrote, you know, use QED correction, it means that every single variable, including this, will actually radiate and it will change, including also the, the angular the angular modulation will also change. Basically, everything inside of this formula will change with QED radiation. OK, and so I'm using this, you know, um, the asymmetry, you know, the uh, a proxy for this structure function that I extracted with my collaborators from uh, from the compass measurements and Hermes. Two minutes. And here is the, the, the results uh, of this. So the no QED calculation is basically this red dot, okay? And we know from the formulae that is basically a modulation that has a sine function with a normalization. So I just quickly fit the, you know, this shape of the uh, red dots using a functional form that follows the sign times and normalization, you can see that it can fit perfectly. This shows that indeed, of course, the bike calculation is correct, that if I don't have a QED correction, I can describe the spectrum with this model. However, after I include the, uh, the QED corrections, the uh, red dots becomes the blue dots, okay? And if I try to fit with the same model, uh, which is in this dashed line, you can see that it can actually fit it because that's not the pattern that it is observed. In fact, if you add a term, an additional term, then you can make it like a more closer, but you can already see that the QED effects are tampering. And in fact, for some reason that is, you know, because of the kinematics, the major effects are around phi h of equal to pi, where, you know, the distribution becomes not like an ordinary sinusoidal modulation. Uh, the same story happens for the Collins asymmetry. And by the way, the fact that this thing leaks out it means that basically in this formula, the QED radiation is generating by, you know, by construction other types of modulation. And this is basically impractical if experimentalists are going to try to uh, correct the data on themselves. So uh, here is my summary. Um, the takeaway message is that, you know, our ship that goes into these hydrogen structure studies, you know, is really radiating electrons and it's preventing us to really, you know, apply uh, the ordinary cro the, uh, CDs cross sections and, you know, interpret directly in QCD because QED is basically tampering with this uh, un uncertainty on the, on the actual photon, which is our probe. So in reality, the experimental bright frame, I think is fiction. You know, I think this changes event by event in, you know, through the radiation and needs to be basically folded within a comprehensive QED plus QCD formalism. And, you know, if we really want to go to the next frontier with this ship, we really need to embrace QED and it is what it is. And I will take questions if any, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have questions for Nobuo? Everyone is too tired and too hungry. Valerio, please go ahead. Yes, hi, Nobu. Thanks. So uh, I have a question concerning slide 19. Uh, perhaps I'm just uh, I'm just uh, misunderstanding the plot. Uh, so so uh, yeah, my understanding is that uh, radiative uh, um, QED corrections are very large, so it can be as large as I don't know, 70%, uh, 80%. Is is that is this interpretation correct? That's right. Yeah, that, that's that's really a lot, isn't that? Yeah, I and mean, the worst thing is that it depends even on the input structure function. So if you change, you know, if I vary that, this radiation also change. 
So the so the, the pro, one important thing is that this ratio can be you know is typically used as a proxy to correct the data right to get to the bone cross section, but these yeah. ratios are not fixed. So oh. I mean the problem is that the problem is that QED correction you know uh, what happened is that this um, this collinear radiation right really changes. The, the the photon direction and and most of the effects comes from basically changing the pt of you know right right i mean maybe you can keep it offline but as you said that's collinear radiation it shouldn't uh, shouldn't affect uh, the 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 pt of the the photon right no it does because you see if you radiate you know these two guys differently the direction of this is not fixed you would change the direction just by eye. Think about shrinking and enlarging these vectors. You will have a, you know, you you will have an uncertainty on the transverse momentum of the photon that is not controlled. Right. right, right. Okay. Yes, I see. Thank you. Hello, this is uh, Stefan. I have a question um, about the, uh, say, experimental aspects. Is it uh, interesting to to do some measurements there, where, of course, then the radiated photons will have some finite PT, so it's not completely collinear. Uh, do we learn something from such measurements, possibly? Um, I am not sure what do you mean by measurements of photons because this ought to be a yeah. virtual photon that gets absorbed so, by the hyronic part right so we can for example measure inclusive dis uh, but then plus a photon uh, which possibly is radiated from the electron line right. so it's not inclusive but uh, whatever a electron plus photon plus x for example and then uh, can we test your formalism or is there anything to gain or is it just a uh, QED and trivial and not worth to measure? Um, I wouldn't say yes or no. I need to think a little bit more, but in general, my, you know, our suggestion to the experimental community is that probably for the inclusive DIS, the, the situation is not as bad because you don't have the transverse momentum, right? It's just inclusive DIS. But for semi-inclusive DIS, when you are becoming more differential in the process, then, you know, like, you know, having this PT, you will be sensitive to the QED significantly. Hence, it will be better to not to attempt to correct the cross-section, but just give the cross-section as it was measured. And then let the you know, phenol people to try to embrace QED by themselves. Yes, it would be more difficult, but I don't think it's impossible. So essentially, we should publish the um, experimental cuts, or uh, what, how these photons, which are of course there in, in real life, are treated. Whether right. they are, uh, yeah, okay. I, don't think, I, I think that, you know, there is a no-go theorem, in my opinion, in trying to extract city structure functions without QED. I think that is fiction. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. If there are no further questions from the wall, let me thank all the speakers in the session, and we will break mine in about 22 minutes. Have a nice break, have a nice lunch for those who have lunch. See you later.